first talk this afternoon is by Keith Miller, who's with the Department of Biological Sciences at Messiah University, the school where I spent my first two years of learning chemistry. And Keith's talk is, What is Truth? The Contemporary Challenge to the Pursuit of Truth. Keith? There we go. Well, uh, thank you very much for uh, this opportunity. Uh, what I'm hoping to do in my remarks uh, this afternoon is to attempt to address uh, what I perceive as the factors that in our contemporary culture provide barriers uh, to the pursuit of truth. So the problem as I see it is not so much uh, in our contemporary culture is the you know, outright rejection of truth claims, but rather the absence of a common basis by which people can discern uh, truth from error or truth from falsehood. And this is more than just um, relating to scientific claims but I argue that this applies to truth claims of any sort, of any kind, uh, even um, the acceptance of uh, objective observational facts. And these problems are not just a part of the um, secular community, but are also, have penetrated into the church. So, the. Factors I'm going to address are fourfold. Uh, so I see these, again, as, as things that act against uh, a common basis upon which to discern truth from error. And these include uh, the loss of commonly held assumptions, uh, the loss of historical knowledge, uh, the loss of trust in expert communities, and uh, the loss of a common experience. So, the first one uh, is dealing with assumptions. Any truth claims of any sort in any field of knowledge are fundamentally anchored in assumptions that themselves are not provable. They're just taken as a priori uh, assumptions. Uh, and in, in science, there's a number of these um, required assumptions in order to actively pursue uh, scientific investigation. But I would argue that they also apply to almost all other uh, pursuits of truth as well. So, we're going to mention three of these, or discuss three of these. One is that there is an objective physical and spiritual reality that's independent of the observer. In other words, regardless of what I think the world is like, regardless of what I understand to be the nature of the physical universe, independent of that, there is an objective physical reality that exists. Uh, and I would say even in the spiritual realm as well, there's an ob objective um, spiritual reality. And also that our perceptions, various ways that we can perceive uh, the physical world around us, actually give us real information about that objective reality. Uh, yes, our senses can deceive us, um, but that in general, what we perceive by our senses gives us actual real information about that real world. Uh, if you don't have that assumption, you can't investigate the world because if you don't know that it actually correlates with reality. Um, so, you know, if I approach a wall, I know that I can't walk through it, right? Because that's what my senses are telling me. It's really telling me something true about the universe. And, our perceptions and our truth claims about that reality have to be tested against that 
reality. So, um, so we are, the hope is that over time, our understanding of the universe will more and more closely approach that actual reality. Um, so, um, I think that from a, a Christian perspective, from a theistic perspective, our understanding of the character of God undergirds those assumptions. Um, so, for example, we believe in a God whose character and being are unchanging. So there's this uniform, this stability, this stable truth of the character of God. And because God has a unchanging character, creation follows regular, consistent, and predictable patterns. And I think furthermore, and this is really important, that the very good creation um, and our personal embodiment as physical beings essentially validate the value of physical reality. There's lots of, you know, there's the, the Gnostic heresies uh, in the early history of the church, uh, and those kind of views still kind of get carried into, even up to, to the present day, of seeing somehow the physical is bad and the spiritual is good. Um, but God has blessed the physical. It's his creation. We are embodied physical beings made in the image of God, and, and God himself, in the person of Christ, entered into that physical reality. So in kind of all possible ways, God has validated the value of the physical. And God does not lie or deceive. God is a God of truth. So if we're pursuing truth, that we are pursuing God. Because God embodies truth of all kinds. So we recognize that there is this real reality that's out there. But we also know that we are limited beings. And we're also fallen beings. And so our understanding and knowledge of that reality is limited. And it's subject to error. And this is really important, um, that we are imperfect, our knowledge is imperfect. Um, and I kind of harken back to the, the phrase in, in scripture that we see is through a glass darkly, okay? And that is a critical understanding of our position relative to knowledge of the real reality of the universe. And it also, I think, um, re requires that in pursuit of knowledge of that reality, that this has to be done in a community. Because each of us have misperceptions, each of us have, have blind spots, and it's when you get in a community that there is the opportunity for correction. And I think isolated individuals or even isolated groups that are, that are isolated from the larger community are much more likely to fall into serious error. And that's proven historically, both within the history of science and in the history of the church. Um, that, that heresies and, and uh, um, religious life and spiritual life and uh, false rabbit holes in, in the pursuit of understanding the universe often um, are because people or groups or individuals are operating in isolation. Um, so, in, in a spiritual sense, um, discernment of spiritual truth occurs within a community. I mean, that's very much uh, a statement of the gospel, uh, is that the kingdom of God is a community, and it's in that community that we can properly learn about the character of God and the character of the universe. Um, so, um, one of the, the problems is if those shared assumptions are not present, 
that um, what happens is that the individual becomes the arbiter of truth because we don't have a common way of, of testing our ideas. Um, so, you know, my, my, my idea is just as good as yours or better, right? Um, and the tendency to hold on to uh, understandings and perceptions and beliefs um, is, can actually be a negative thing if that understanding, if that belief is an error. It's not praiseworthy to be obstinately you know, determined to hold on to your positions if those positions are false. Our, our interest should be each one of us working towards this true reality, uh, making our own individual paths, and we should be moving together toward this ultimate goal. Uh, and as a result, our understanding, because we're being corrected, because our understanding of the universe and of, of uh, nature of God is something that grows over time, um, that understanding of truth is not static. It evolves. Uh, so just as scientific understandings of the, of the natural world have changed over time, so are theological understandings. And they should. They shouldn't be static because we know, at least in some cases, our knowledge is incomplete, as if, uh, if not outright false in some ways. And if, if you want to have a static theology, you are locking yourself into error. All right, so growing out of that is um, that uh, because knowledge evolves, it's historical. So it is limited by the current state of knowledge, by our current uh, theoretical understandings, or by our technology. And it's a transitory state, okay, that we are in some kind of special place in history. Um, you know, we look back into past conceptions and say, how could they possibly think that? Maybe 100 years from now, they'll look at us and say, how could they possibly think that? Um, so it's an historical process. And um, because uh, it's an historical process, it's constantly subject to correction, modification, and expansion. And I think that applies to our theological understandings as well as understands the physical universe. Um, so uh, I would argue that the practice of any discipline requires an historical knowledge. It's really important that we understand the history of ideas um, because otherwise we're bound to repeat past errors and we're bound to have a false understanding or an unreasonable understanding of the veracity of what we currently believe. Um, so we need to think of why did ideas change in the past? Why do I have these current theoretical understandings of what the natural world is like when that wasn't held in the past? What events, what questions cause those ideas to change? So historical context provides a critical foundation for understanding and evaluating current claims. Um, truth claims don't appear in a vacuum. Um, so we should ask questions of, what is the context? I, you hear a truth claim. What is the context for that truth claim? Why was it made? What were the circumstances under which that claim arose? Uh, what evidence was used to support the claim? Was there a particular motive involved? Was there a particular cultural influence in that uh, theoretical understanding? So history is our teacher. And God is the God of history. That's, that scripture is nothing but a historical retelling of God's interaction with humanity. And God repeatedly calls us to remember. There's a reason for that. We need to know our history. 
History, our knowledge of history guards against being deceived. And it also provides a lot of evidence, records of people's um, both good experiences, good decisions, and bad decisions that we can learn from. Um, historical perspective also brings a certain humility, uh, recognition that our current understandings are incomplete and in some cases wrong. Uh, and we may find answers to some of our questions by looking at that history. Uh, through the thoughts, struggles, uh, and failures of those that came before us. And the loss of this history results in hubris um, and the likely repetition of past error. And another aspect of this, as part of this idea of community, is the trust in expert communities. Uh, there's been a lot of undermining of the um, respect toward uh, the community of experts in a particular discipline. That community is a repository of all this past knowledge. Um, and the consensus view of that community is important. It doesn't mean it's completely correct. In fact, we know that it isn't completely correct. But it cannot be disregarded because it, it's a it's a compilation of what has been known and understood up until that time. Um, and that community is actually very, very conservative. Um, it's very resistant to change. Um, I'm sure lots of you in your scientific work know that new kind of marginal ideas find it very difficult to be brought into the consensus. It takes work to do that. New ideas have to prove themselves by accumulating a pervasive body of knowledge to change the views of the larger community. And that's good. That is exactly the way that community should work. And consensus provides uh, stability. Uh, it keeps the community of, of workers in that discipline working towards a common goal rather than being split up into a whole lot of different groups that are all following a dead-end rabbit holes. Um, and in um, theology, uh, it, it keeps, as the Bible says, it keeps us from being blown here and there by, by every uh, wind of teaching. Um, and if there isn't a consensus on an issue, we should hold those views very lightly. Uh, consensus guards against major error. Um, and one way that that's dealt with in the scientific community is peer review. Um, I know that, that, that um, this is, peer review isn't always the, the happiest thing that we have to deal with in our uh, professional careers, but it's a necessity. Uh, and um, what's, I think, one of the, again, one of the obstacles that's preventing uh, a, a productive pursuit of truth claims is that now, especially with social media and uh, various media outlets and things like that, um, the, there is no longer a, an acceptance of, of this consensus and there's a whole lot of like, isolated communities that have their own internal um, organizations, uh, media sources, experts, and so forth, uh, so that um, it's very difficult for the public to discern truth when there are all these divergent voices uh, that are all in their own little isolated uh, bubbles. Um, And the last um, thing I want to mention is the lack of common experience. Um, again, this is, this is a result of people, uh, of us uh, placing ourselves in these kind of isolated bubbles. Um, and this creates polarization. 
uh, and separation of people into like-minded communities. Uh, and uh, this isolation, again, allows people to stay in their own echo chambers and prevents communication across divides. And it also it, uh, incorporates not just um, discipline, disciplinary positions, but also it, pre it prevents barriers through all kinds of other uh, diverse aspects of diversity, racial diversity, cultural diversity, sexual identities, national identities, etc. So we find all these different ways of partitioning ourselves into these isolated communities and not interacting. And that can't do anything but inhibit the pursuit of truth. So um, the lack of interaction uh, between people in these different bubbles uh, leads to misunderstanding, prejudice, and fear, which I think is becoming very evident in our uh, current culture. And people fear what they don't understand or don't know. And listening to others' experience um, is really important. Uh, I think that's in a sense of a part we can take away from uh, Dr. Swamadas's uh, earlier uh, experience, that um, we need to have the voices and experience and perspectives of those that are different from us, with different life experiences, different um, disciplinary experiences. And this is something that is part of the church as well, as we all know. Uh, churches have, are segregated, community, religious worshiping communities are segregated uh, in all manner of different ways. And again, if we are pursuing spiritual truth, uh, let alone uh, truth of the physical universe, um, that segregation prevents us from properly seeing the true character of God, the true nature of God's kingdom. We only see a, a part of that uh, global kingdom that God is calling us to. So in summary, um, there's an objective reality and our knowledge of that reality is incomplete and subject to error and that requires us to live in a diverse community and pay attention to the history of ideas and to be willing to um, appreciate and honor uh, expert testimony, ex uh, expert com uh, physicians, expert community, um, and to seek to break through the many barriers that divide us from one another. Thank you. Okay, time for questions, and uh, I'll bring a mic so it's recorded. Anybody going to raise a hand? Do come this way. Uh, thank you, Dr. Miller, for your talk. I just wanted to um, make a comment just to, just to thank you and to uh, echo my support of what you said. Um, I'm a theolo uh, theology student at Fuller. And this kind of um, epistemological crisis is what drives a lot of my work in science and religion. Um, I wanted to offer a, a lot of what you said reminds me most of um, Josh Reeves' Against Method in Science and Religion. I think he published it in 2019. It's, it's pretty recent. But um, he makes a lot of those, those same arguments, talking about how moving away from uh, a fixation on method and envisioning the sciences as, um, you know, plain you practice personal knowledge. He uses the term local critical realism as a way forward. Um, critical realism has been uh, the major term in science and religion, but to say local criti critical realism um, as a way to affirm shared objective reality but acknowledge the historical aspects of knowledge. So I yeah, just wanted to say thank you. Thanks.
Um, I had a question about some of the causes of these changes that you've mentioned and this lack of um, consensus and so forth and what the church can do about them. I'm, I'm particularly thinking about, you know, in the case of um, experts where experts deliberately use their expertise to deceive or where expertise has found out to be wrong and has led people in wrong directions or things like in science where expertise is used not for necessarily things that are good, but for destructive means like nuclear weapons or things like that. How does the church deal with those places where um, our fallen human nature kind of intrudes into these areas and causes us to be skeptical of those? Um, yeah, maybe a couple things. One is I, I want to emphasize that um, people who might present themselves as experts um, is, is different from what I'm referring to as expert, the expert community, spoke broadly speaking. In other words, what is the kind of global uh, consensus of biological science or of physics or of... Um, so what is the current paradigm, let's put it that way, that's driving our, our research? Um, that's different from some individual who uh, claims expertise and draws kind of a following after them. I'm talking more about the overarching paradigms that direct our current research. And again, those paradigms get overturned. But it's hard to overturn them, and it should be. Because if, if a paradigm can be switched very easily, we're going to be bouncing all over the place and, and not having any kind of coherent uh, research program. Uh, and I think the same thing is true in, in theology. Uh, that again, I, I'm a real advocate for um, experiencing uh, Christian community in a variety of different denominational and theological settings. Because, you know, every kind of, of, of um, you know, theological movement in, in, in church history has truth there, but it also has error there. Uh, and so if we, we keep to our own kind of train track and ignore the other, other kind of trends of theological thinking in, in, in other communities, we're missing something of truth, of theological truth, we're missing something of what the kingdom of God should look like. So it's, I think it's really necessary that we bridge that. Um, to your last question about how we avoid having science or other knowledge be put to nefarious purposes, um, all I can say there is that we have a very a strong model of what the Christian life should look like, and that's in Jesus Christ and his teaching and life. And it seems to me any question like that is, how, how does the life and ministry of Christ shed light on the, the, the moral value or ethical purpose of that? And that's what we should be testing against. Again, that's, that's kind of the focal truth, focal moral theological truth is in the person of Christ. So if we direct our questions there, we're less apt to, to fall into those kind of serious errors. Let's thank Dr. Miller for this uh, engaging talk. Good appreciation.